Hi everyone. That week went past fast, 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 fast. <laughs> I hope you're all okay. I'm really well, thank you. And let's do sound check. Can anyone tell me? Can you hear me? Testing, testing. <laughs> I will say hello to Marianne and Verpi and Donald and Stefan and Julie. Let's see, who else am I missing? Oh good, thank you Julie. Thank you for your wonderful messages. And um, thank you Marianne. Has the angel appeared yet? I gave you your um, tracking number. I don't know if you've checked it out to see. Hi, Drew and Denise. Thank you. So, um, I want to give you guys a choice tonight. I really loved last week reading from my new book. But I'm also... Hey, hey! I can't wait. Take a picture, take a picture, please, please, please. Anyway, uh, I don't know if I told you, but I'm, I think I did tell you. I'm also been commissioned to write another book. And that's for a gentleman called Tony King. But his real name at one point in his life was Bob Evans. And he was with Badfinger for several years. And... Um, I have chapter eight. I thought maybe I could read that to you if you wanted to hear a little bit of some of the Badfinger story after Pete Ham had died. And um, there's very little about the next phase before Tommy decides to die as well. And the reason being is that they were at Bob Evans' house in near Detroit and I could read you some of that because it's a very interesting story if if you're up for that yes please Julie says <laughs> and interesting is that there is um hi Yvonne you're not too late it's good um interesting is that we're doing a concert for Flint, Flint Aid on the 16th and I think the 17th or it's the 15th and the 16th. 16th and 17th in Flint at the Dort Center. And I know Julie lives very close to there and you said that you might like to help and I what I'll do is I'll email your um, you two hi. Okay, um, Julie, I'll send you the promoter's name because he is looking for local people to help and you'll get in and your husband too or anyone else that wants to help in any way. Um, the second date is an afternoon. We're going to try to um, get local kids in for less money that are, don't have much money and also the interesting thing is that there be some people from Motown maybe Stevie Wonder but don't tell anyone it's a secret <laughs> and um, a man called John Wilson that also played with Badfinger will be joining Bob Evans come Tony King and playing Badfinger songs and there's the Romantics um, Bill Haley Jr. playing his dad's rock and roll hits since he was the um, basically the founder of rock and roll and we've got the TKP band which will have Billy Barnett from Fleawood Mac and all the guys will be playing together Rick Derringer, I can't forget him it is um quite something it's a it the Dort financial Se center is a lot of people big big arena so um i gotta get on with designing the back visuals <laughs> which i really love doing and we'll see how it goes so 
I think there's a totally Jenny, that's what's going to happen. It's whoever helps gets entry, particularly if they know me. <laughs> because I have to meet them. Anyway, um, I'm quite happy to read a bit of the Badfinger experience, which you will not find anywhere else until you get the book or hear me reading it. <laughs> the Dort Center is very big, this is true. But the promoter thinks no problem selling out, particularly since we're trying to raise money for Flint Aid. I don't know if you're aware of the poisoning of a lot of the people from um, cutting off the fresh water from Lake Huron. And they're not well people. Tony was supposed, was asked to do this before COVID, but of course he couldn't. So now he's resurrecting it. Okay, people, are you ready? Yeah, Marianne, it's quite something it's going to be. Lots of people are going to come. We're just building the list. We're keeping a secret. I know, Julie, it's devastating. When Tony was asked, or Bob was asked, by his son who was working, I think, with the governor or something in the offices. He went along and he said it was really tragic how sick people were. And um, so here we are trying to raise some money for them and bring beauty and stuff. Okay, here we go. This is chapter eight in Tony's um, book which at the moment the title is Becoming Tony King. When the tour was over, I was looking for a producer for the LP we were recording in 1979. We were recording in Studio A in Dearborn, Michigan. Eric Morgeson, our engineer, recommended Joey Mullen from Badfinger to write with me as well as produce our band. We called him and Joey agreed. He flew out in the autumn of 1979, and when he arrived, we picked up our guitars and began to play to break the ice. We soon cut the power pop single, She's My Girl. Joey not only produced, but he sang, played guitar, and composed songs. In one week, we did demos of five songs. The Detroit media spoke of our likeness to Badfinger, and we were destined for stardom. The description followed us everywhere. After this, Joey approached Chris Wilson, our manager. Hey, Chris, let me take the lads out to L.A. so I can develop them more. Joey not only would produce us, but he taught us how to write, sing, and play. So it was approved, and we went off to L.A. We stayed for two to three months. We lived in Canoga Park and had such a creative time. Around the same time, I got a call from Mike Gibbons, who was the drummer of Badfinger. He was so excited about our music. Within the same breath, he asked to join Straight Up, which was Tony's band at the time. I believe Joey had shared our new songs with the Badfinger community, when in 1981, Mike Gibbons joined Straight Up and moved from Wales to Detroit to live with me and Sandra in our Royal Oak home. In early 1982, Badfinger's Tom Evans also joined the band and moved in shortly after. Apparently, change the page. Apparently, before Tommy met me, Mike had said to him, Tony reminds me of Paul McCartney a little bit. And Mike also said, you got to check out this guy, Tony King. He also looks like Nick Lowe. It was after this that Tommy called me and we talked and he decided to come to America and we started writing songs together. And the first song that we wrote was for Laura King, I Met You After Christmas. 
and we also wrote Elysian Fields. When Tommy came over, he walked down the elevator of the metro plane, and upon seeing McGibbons, he turned around and walked back up the escalator. However, he did come back down. It was only a joke. He was so happy to see his old bandmate from the Ivies and Badfinger. He gave me a huge hug, too, and said, Tony, you're so tall and you look just like Paul McCartney. This was the first time I had met Tom. We all went to the airport bar and broke the ice over a Guinness or two. And when we got into the car to take him to our home, he surprised me by playing some straight up songs on his Walkman. When we arrived, he was super talkative. We showed him around the house when he exclaimed, Wow, there's a basement. He flopped onto the big black chair and shouted, I'm home, I'm home, I love this basement. Everybody crashed pretty early because we got in late. He got up the next morning and he took a long bath. I walked by and he was on his hands and knees scrubbing out the bathtub. I'd never seen anybody scrub the bathtub after they took a bath. He was such a well-mannered guy. My dad and Tommy often hung out at the piano for two hours, belting out one great song after another. <clears throat> Mike and everybody stood by and watched them in awe. <coughs> Sorry. We wrote some great songs on that piano, helped by my dad on a couple of occasions. My father and Tommy became very close and would often walk out the front door to Jagmar's pub at the end of the street. The entire band would follow them to the pub to have a drink. One day, Tommy found out that my dad had lived in Hollywood in 1940 when he asked Dad, What was it like living in Hollywood in 1940, Jack? What other girls did you date? What other stars did you know? My dad loved sharing his unique history as a horn player and a singer in the big bands. I never grew tired of hearing about his adventures and how he was discovered during the Great Depression, busking on the street, playing his horn. Just need a drink. I remember after our first rehearsal, we all were at the pub and this guy, Marty, played a polka vision of Without You. I can't live, I can't live anymore. One of my favorite songs, I have to say, he played it on an accordion. My dad shouted to the people around the bar, this is the guy who wrote that song. Whereupon dad encouraged Tommy to get up on stage and sing with my dad. After Tommy said, great version, I wish I'd gotten paid for it. At the time we drank 24 ounce beers, which made it easy to have many deep conversations about the past. Tommy told stories about how we worked with John and George and Ringo and Paul. Tommy talked about the White Album. He told us he was there on the album, but uncredited. John went into Abbey Road Studios a couple of times. They did Jealous Guy, Crippled Inside, and I Don't Want to Be a Soldier. One particularly odd thing was that John never called them by their name. He would simply say, Badfinger play. Later, when George did All Things Must Come to Pass, he had everybody play. Paul and George helped on so many more Badfinger songs, but it came to a sad end. George loved that band and was heartbroken when he heard that Peter Ham had died. The tragedy of the breakup of the Beatles and Apple left them penniless. Some of the untold stories shall be revealed within these two pages. One story which has never been told is how Tony paid for Mike and Tom to come over to live with him. He bought them gear, their food, in fact everything they needed and basically he hoped to repair what was broken. He loved their music and had a kinship as a songwriter for theirs. Basically, he helped to bring Badfinger back to life. Over the days, it became the Badfinger revival, but only after Tommy released his sorrow. Dad became his mentor. 
One of the saddest stories was when Joey Mulholland and Tommy signed a two-album record deal with Radio Records in Florida. They had finished recording Stay No More when Johnny insisted that they get paid the balance of the deposit with threats that he would not come to finish the deal if they didn't get the money. They had been paid only half of the deposit, which was normal. It seems both Tom and Mick stood by the record company with trust. Hmm. This started a row between Joey and Tommy. The record company had plans to release another album called Stars on 45, which was a medley of 15 Beatles songs. Despite the trust Tom and Mick had with the company, they decided to put their money into the new re recording and kill the deal with Badfinger after Joey's threat. Quite coincidentally, Badfinger's song, Hold On, had been released by Warner Brothers and was climbing the charts until the dispute over Johnny's threat. I have often wondered who and why would kill their own song. Though the lads had no f f financial assets except their modest homes back in the UK, it was a really joyous time living and writing and singing together. Most days, my dad, Tom, Mick, and I would come together by the piano in a songwriter glee. <clears throat> Tony said, I do wish I had a tape recording of the time my dad was belting out Barbara Allen by the Everly Brothers or my Irish Rose along with Tom Evans with Badfinger. This was utterly amazing. The two high tenors often gathered around dad's beloved piano in the living room during rehearsals for the Badfinger World Tour 1982. Tommy stayed at the house I shared with my fiance, model Sandra Anderson in Royal Oak. Most days he would go over to my dad, would sit at dad's piano and sing one classic song after another. It was the battle of the tenors filled with laughter. After everyone would head off to the pub, such memories still inspire my life each day. In 1982, Badfinger rehearsals started out great and the band rocked. The music flowed again. A ton of great new songs were written and recorded by my band. Tom Evans and I wrote some and some with Mike. I added four of the Joey Mull and Tony King songs to the show. We put out a really good version of Perfection in Day After Day and Acoustic Guitars. We needed to, a slide guitar player to do day after day, day live. I had met this great kid, Adam Allen, who played slide guitar, so we called him for the Badfinger World Tour. We began the sold-out World Tour in March 1982 through until April. It continued on the East Coast in May. Sometimes Mike would walk out onto the stage and play a wine bottle, tapping it with a drumstick for percussion, while we all would do an acoustic version of Day After Day. Our hearts were filled with laughter, so much fun, but it was evident that Tommy had a drinking problem. While at Dad's, it was not that evident until we were out on the road without the safety net of the home full of love that his demons began to appear. We arrived late for our gig in White Plains and went straight into the venue to do a sound check. We went back into the bus to rest when there came a knock at the door of the bus. Bruner, Bruno, owner of the hall, stood there angry. What the fuck is going on here? Apparently, in between sound check and the gig, he got a phone call from Joey Mullen. I got this phone call from a guy called Joey Mullen saying, you guys are not the real bad finger. The bus at that point was surrounded by these heavy dudes. Bruno shouted, Yo, are going to go to jail. We were shaken. I had to keep it together, even though I feared the worst. I was only 25, but I found the strength to find a resolution. It happened that I had a Badfinger Magic Christian songbook book and showed it to Pruno, pointing to the photo. I shouted to the lads who were in the back of the bus, Get out here, tell him who you are. They appeared white as a sheet. This is Tom Evans and Mick Gibbons, I explained. They are the two original members on the cover. They are the real deal. 
By this time, someone had called the police and 25 New York State police cars arrived, lights blinking and sirens blaring. They were big dudes in navy blue with guns slapped to their waist. It was like something out of the movie Godfather. One of the cops approached and asked, What's going on here? Bruno related the problem, which by then he had accepted our story. Fortunately, one of the cops recognized them. Oh my God, that's the real boys from Badfinger. Whereupon some of the fans were arriving at that time with albums needing to be signed. And so it was the real Badfinger survived another day signing autographs for their fans and the policemen. In fact, the gig has to be one of the best we performed on that tour. Sadly, this was not a random occurrence. In fact, Joey's agents made calls throughout our tour saying we were fake. It happened again and again, on and on. We had to verify that they were the real Badfinger in many places like Providence, Rhode Island, or Boston, Massachusetts, or upstate Vermont. <sighs> on the East Coast, we played with Arlo Guthrie at a big place in Boston. This is where I found out that Arlo produced handmade guitars. And after a sellout show the next day in New York, we headed up to the next show on the Vermont border on a beautiful spring day. And Arlo, who was a big Bad Finger and Tom Evans fan, invited us out during the show. One of his guys showed us with some about some guitars that Arlo had built. They were really special. And as we were leaving, Arlo said he was going to make a guitar for Tommy. And that cheered Tommy up a bit. Somewhere on the road, we pulled into a rest stop on New Jersey Highway 95 to get gas and some refreshments. I was standing outside having a smoke when through the window, I saw the cashier confiscate Tommy's MasterCard. A blank stare fell upon his face as he, his card was being cut into pieces. His drinking escalated after that. In fact, sometimes it was so bad on stage that we had to turn off his mic and guitar as he would be screaming instead of singing his harmonies. In fact, he would sleep most of the time in the bus. He sunk into a deep depression. And previously, Tommy would be up playing songs with us or playing cards. We tried to wake him up by singing the theme song of the TV show Leave It to Beaver, a program which he hated. We had to do this to get him up and being with us creating. He did, but only after a few beers that he would pick up his guitar. Somewhere driving on the I-95, the bus's transmission broke. We were in the middle of the three-lane highway when the new bus just stopped. Wow, Tommy just piped up and said to the driver with a smirk, Welcome to Badfinger. Little did we, the band, know at the time Joey Mullen was suing Tommy for a piece of the song Without You, which he had nothing to do with its writing. Neither was he in the band at the time it was recorded. Tommy's heart weighed heavy. We were to do a showcase in the city and all the people from the music industry came. When we did our next show, a lot of record agents and label people came out and saw the band. My old friend, Frank Marcelona from Premier Talent, came out. He was Humble Pie's, Bruce Springsteen's YouTube agent, as well as Pink Floyd. I knew him. Anyway, he brought some people from CBS out, as well as Clive Davis people. During the rehearsals, we got into a huge row, and I said, I'm not going back out and sing day after day and come and get it again. We need to create some new material. I think we should work on a record. My main concern was to make a great new Badfinger record rather than just keep performing the same old material because Tommy and Mike and me all loved R&B. I'd gone down to Manny's in the village and brought a new Steinway bass and, a new, and new clothes. I gave Clarkie, our roadie, the responsibility to keep an eye on Tommy. Make sure he's sober for the gig. And when Tommy was sober, he was the best high tenor. But it was not to be for the showcase. He was really out of it. And once again, we had to turn off his mic and I would sing his part. 
on top of which he vomited onto my new guitar during the show. Well, that was it. I was leaving. I had enough. That was when the, a big disagreement came in because Tommy was hurting for money big time. He wanted to go back, back out and play, but I didn't want to. I wanted to get the record done. As I was leaving, Tommy shouted, pulling at his jacket. You can't leave. You can't leave. And I looked straight in his eyes. You have to stop drinking. He shouted again. What? I can't have a few drinks. You can't leave me. Leaving, I said, call me when you want to record. I went home. I wanted to work on a new album, which would be called The Messenger. I kept Tommy updated on the phone every other day, and he was excited about what we did. Tony Kay was going to produce the demos for the Re Messenger record. They continued with a new band with Donnie Dockett and Bob Jackson, but couldn't get any gigs. And Mix Gibbon had gone back to Michigan to live with his girlfriend, Flo. Tommy followed. Sadly, as they didn't have an agent to book gigs, Jackson and Flo referred them to a man called Johnny Cash, who was a Milwaukee promoter and gave him a five-year management deal. They moved to Milwaukee, lived in a show house, no gigs, no food, stuck again. It was a replay of the time they lived with Bill, Bill Collins' house in the UK without heating or hot water. They were getting only five pounds a week, and because they had an apple tree in the garden, Pete Ham in those days said, Thank God we had an apple tree because we had apples in the morning and the afternoon and for evening. So history was be repeating itself. Worse than that, they were playing in small bars, dark and dingy. One day, Tommy called asking me for help. Please, could you come back and do some gigs? I was out playing with my brother on Straight Up Tour. I asked Frank Barcelona if it was a good idea and he said, Is he drinking? Go check them out. So straight up, went out with them. They were my friends. We were to play at the Milwaukee Oktoberfest as we walked into the venue to rehearse when one of the fenders blew out its co cone on fire. It exploded into the curtain just behind which started on fire. The flames moved fast. Oh my God, I thought the place was going to go up in flames. We left the building ASAP, and suddenly we're surrounded with firemen and water hoses. I've never seen a fender do that until that day. We did a couple more shows, and nobody got paid, including me. We went to a show in Stephen, Stephen Travis, Michigan. It was a big show, which featured Bad Fingers, Straight Up, and Tony Kay from Yes. My band, Straight Up, opened. It was a great show, but we didn't get paid. Our last gig was in a derelict ski resort. What's this? That cast doesn't know what he's doing, I said, and I was disgusted. If we're get, not getting paid, I'm done. I had a bunch of roadies from Michigan who helped on tour, and there was no money. Everybody went home, and that was the last straw. Tommy said, I want to go back to London and sort out this stuff with Apple. Because when Apple um, went through their problems, they withheld a lot of money that belonged to Badfinger, apparently. I told him, if you really want to get it together, and I know you do, then I'm sure Frank Barcelona will represent you as a solo artist. He decided to go back to England instead. After we all left the tour, Cass sued Tommy for a breach of contract for $5 million dollars. It is debatable if Tommy actually signed a contract with him. Plus, I doubt he knew that T Joey Mullen was also suing Tommy for points on Without You. Cass's case was thrown out of court, and that song was the second most played song of all time. It followed Tommy everywhere, and sometimes he felt Badfinger was a curse and was over when Pete Ham died. Before he left, my dad said to Tommy, be very careful, Tom. Come back here and I get, I'll get you lawyers to help you. Remember, we don't know what happened to Pete Ham, really. I want you to promise me you will be careful. 
bad things can happen in a sleepy town with only a hundred people. On November 19th, 1983, Tom died. His wife, Marianne, called me the day he had died and told me they put the cause of death as suicide. I'm really not so sure. The whole thing ended in a cloud of mystery. After that happened, Joey Mullen called me and we went down to Columbus, Ohio, where he lived in 1984, and where with Joey we did a real nice tribute to Tommy. A reporter came to my house asking about Tom's death, and he asked, Do you have any comment about the death of Tommy Evans, who died in England two hours ago? And I responded with, Yes, that ha house is now empty, the cupboard is bare, and the clock has stopped ticking. No further comment and closed the door. Some years later, in 2002, Paul McCartney told us, this was one of my greatest achievements, signing and producing back the bad, bad finger period. He remembered their great vocals, humor, and songwriting skills. Jim Keltner has always told me his friend George Harrison also thought they were the best. So did John Lennon and Sir George Martin and my old boss, my partner in Air UK, Peter Sullivan. Both wanted to produce Bad Ringer. Don Everly told me Without You was his favorite song, and Chet Atkins and my mentor Harry Warner at BMI said the same. We all felt very proud of these accolades from such esteemed musicians. It's just a tragedy that they didn't get the money they deserved in the recognition. And the story does go on, but that's it for the moment. That's not a problem, Julie. You talk to Jeffrey. So, what do you think? Hmm. There's so much more to Tony's um, experience in Nashville and his own personal life. And, wow. So that's just the beginning. Well, there's lots before that chapter and lots after. Thank you, Marianne. Now, I have a question. Do we do some meditation healing or do you want a story out of Behind the Wall? Thank you very much, Jenny. I like the fact of what you said. It's amazing that these bands managed to get the success they did. Imagine they lived because they were doing back-to-back -back gigs for years. And in those days, musicians got paid really well, especially the big stadiums they were playing. But unfortunately, his, their manager and their financial manager just... Uh, didn't pay them all that millions. Okay. <laughs> right. Denise, how are you actually? Before we begin. Okay. Well, Denise will do a special healing for you after I read. Um, I know, it's a really tragic story. Anyway, the, one of the stories I wanted to tell you was about um, um, where do I start? You know, the, the Floyd did animals and um, this story, this chapter is called Animals in Flight, Battersea Power Station, December 1976. It was early December and the scheduled photography for the Animals album cover was to take place at Battersea Power Station in London. The idea was to suspend a large inflatable pig called algae between the four chimney stacks. Algae was 30 foot long and full of helium and the plan was to tether her within the middle of the antiquated building. 
For extra safety, there was a trained marksman on standby in the event she broke loose. Apparently, Rogers daily drive to Britannia Row in Islington, their recording studio, inspired the idea. He lived across the river just off Clapton Common, and the station was daily a daily vision along the way. The image of the pig was born from the book Animal Farm by George Orwell, as was the concept for the whole album. Storm Thorgerson from Hygmenosis worked together with Roger to design and execute his vision, which the rest of the band accepted. The day arrived and we all gathered at the station to observe the photography of the cover. However, the weather proved to be a bit inclement, so the shoot had to be postponed. In addition, the cables were not secure enough to make it viable. The next day, we arrived to try again, and despite the weather being a bit calmer, dia, 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 oh my goodness, disaster happened. Algae broke loose. The cable snapped, and there was no marksman in sight. She shot up in the air, last reported, heading for the English Channel. It made the news with wonderful caricatures in the morning papers of two airline pilots looking out the window, freaked to see a pig flying next to them. Was it a hallucination? They hadn't been drinking. Oh dear, it's a flying pig. There was great concern that algae would cause an accident in the air, but unfortunately, but fortunately she descended of her own accord, thank God, for the winds had diverted her flight plan. The farmer whose field she came to rest in remained perplexed. There amongst the trees she hovered, bouncing gently before his eyes. He went back inside and made the phone call to the local police. Hello, has uh, anyone uh, reported a missing 30 foot long pig, have you? And the reply was, are you sure you ain't had a pint, have you? Yeah, sure, it ain't a figment of your imagination. No, there really is a giant inflatable pig bouncing around the field. I ain't joking. Has no one reported a missing pig? Word got back to the Floyd, who then sent Robbie Williams and a few of the stage crew to the rescue. Their mission was to retrieve algae safely. The famed mishap is amongst many fables in the Pink Floyd history books. Thenceforth, she and a few cousins became a regular feature in the Animals in the Flesh tours. I, re I even remember that during the Animals tour in the States, one could find an isolated roadie backstage painting little tiny baby ones. The idea would be to release them from algae's behind over the audience. However, that never happened, or at least not to my knowledge. When we returned home to Woodley, word had reached our neighbors, and what was a potential disaster turned out to be the local comical story of the week, or perhaps forever. To them, it just added to all the animal adventures we had had over the years. It brought back memories of how Blue, our peacock, got away and the whole village was on alert trying to capture him, darting from tree to tree, field to field. Stephen Lindor Rourke, our manager, had given him to us for our wedding present with a message, clip his wings. David didn't want to, and unbeknownst to us, peacocks could fly. Therefore, the adventure began and he just flew out over our fence chicken run into the sunset. Algae adventure brought back another animal memory of the time, our neighbor's cow got into our garden. Puddy and I had just returned from shopping and were greeted by, in the dark, a very large cow peering at my window. We tried to chase it back into the next door field, flashing our coats and our metallic wellies we had just bought from Biba, glintering in the moonlight. Poor cow, we must have we must have been such a frightful sight. We were hooting and hollering like two crazy Halloween figures down the drive. We were relieved the cow did make it home, but only after it jumped over our fibre gate like something out of a storybook. Stopping on a dime, its large body just missed the moving rush hour traffic silhouetted by their lights in the dark. 
Pudi and I had just stood there gasping as she, she casually turned right, wandered down the road a bit, and then turned into the field from whence she came. Phew, we did need a cup of tea after that one. We giggled at yet another animal adventure, and many more were to come. <laughs> so, the Pink Floyd story was out. Capital Radio Nikki Horn had broadcast an epic documentary over the course of six weeks. Each program was 45 minutes long and was the most all-embracing expose of their vision and history to date. John Peel at the BBC jumped in and played the whole album, breaking the exclusive arrangements given to Nikki. Animals set the stage to awaken their slumbering public, but often it just brought criticism and conflict instead of enlightenment. Acceptance was not yet to come. It seems to be the way with all visions that challenge the status quo. So Animals Tour began, and the first stop was Germany. The gigs were getting bigger and louder. In addition, as our families grew, our entourage became bigger also. And once again, our personal assistant, Warwick McCready, looked after us. We had Alice and our nanny, Jeannie, with us. We were getting to be dab hands at moving into hotels with a little one. Bed ready, bottles warmed, and dinner was on its way. After the first concert with Alice safely in bed, David and I joined the others at a nightclub party, which the promoters had set up. When we arrived there in a box was a live baby pink, shivering as the loud music surrounded him and the strobe lights revealed his form to us. The promoters thought that it would be really funny. I freaked. The band told Warwick to take it back to the hotel and arrange for the farmer to pick it up as soon as possible, which meant taking him to his room at the hotel until it was resolved. The next morning, Alice, Jeannie, and I went down for breakfast, gathered as much lettuce and other vegetables and bits of fruit as we could, as we could knowing that Warwick would not have thought of that. We waited until we thought it was a reasonable hour to visit and see how the baby pig was had fared. We, prob it, we were probably a bit early, but it was around 10 a.m., Poor Warwick was extremely hungover and moaned as he opened the door. Suddenly he crossed and shouted, Oh my God, as he looked back into his room. All the mirrors on the sliding wardrobe door were cracked. The pig had been snorting at all the other pigs he could see and must have been kissing himself or had an argument to have created such damage. There was a screaming everywhere. His room was literally a pigsty. As we looked around, we noticed that our little pink friend had dragged most of his straw out of the box onto the carpet, which work had laid on its side. As he started to put back the straw, he came upon his underpants, and the piglet obviously had slept with work's underpants all night. We didn't know whether to cry or laugh as the pig was running after work as he tried to rescue his knickers. Alice loved the pig and wanted to feed him. We stayed for a little while until Jeannie shrieked and ran out of the door back to our room. She had forgotten that she was washing the nappies in the bidet and feared she had left the water running, which she had. I was against paper nappies at the time, and we used cloth ones instead. It was a small attempt to save the trees. We washed them in the hotel bidet, while on tour, and when she got there, the water was running through the room and into the room downstairs as well. We all left Steve O'Rourke to settle the situation. Between the pig's mess and ours, the hotel was not too happy. Another rock band destroys the hotel. Actually, the Floyd and their crew really had a good reputation. It was the pyrotechnics that caused a few problems, and of course the airplane, but I'm forgetting foretelling a bit of the future. And that's it. <laughs> yeah, I love that photo. So, um, shall we do a short healing for Denise? 
and um, Denise, could you um, let me know how you're feeling first? What you have you had your um, visit at the hospital? I'll wait a few minutes. I think I have to calm down from that story. <laughs> You're welcome, to. And as of the 24th, which is next week, isn't it? It will be available to have it. Oh no, as the scanner was broken. So still waiting on that one feeling like I'm in limbo. Okay. Well, we're going to try to get you out of limbo. And if we could all be still, find a cup, comfortable position, and I'll put up an image. That for me is one of my sculptures and represents peace and tranquility. Okay. For a moment, let's gaze upon the sculpture in the light of the sculpture. And with your breathing, take the light into your heart. So breathe in the light and hold it and slowly release again. Breathe in. Hold the light and release. Breathe in. Hold the light and release. Now close your eyes and be still. And let's take the breath from the top of your head and slowly, slowly going down past your eyes and your ears and your jaw and your neck and your shoulders and your arms down to the fingertips and back. And today let's go one vertebrae at a time doing sign of the cross, equilateral cross, and a circle of light on each vertebrae, one at a time. Sign of the cross in a circle, the sign of the cross in a circle, the sign of the cross in a circle. Take the light down through the back of your spine to your coccyx. Let's breathe in and take the light all the way down your body. Breathe in and allow the light to flow and clear all tension. Breathe in, relax. Allow the light to flow through your hips, down your thighs, down your knees, calves, your feet, and into Mother Earth. And allow the energy of Mother Earth to come back up your legs, through your feet, to your pelvis, and allow the love of the mother to fill your pelvis region. And Denise, feel that in that area specifically. And let us visualize our love and help Denise with healing her woman situation. Let's put a, a clear
clear ball of green light into that area and visualize we're all in the circle and our hands hover and light of green passes through our palms into that bowl. And take one of your hands and place it over her heart center and visualize pink roses being there, softening, relaxing. And allow the green ball over her woman area to turn to sapphire blue. Relaxing, healing, The knees be relaxed and breathe in a golden light and allow it to filter down through your whole body and particularly focus in that orb of crystal green and blue fill it with this golden light and say to yourself and allow everyone to say it with you I love my heart and soul I love all of humanity join our hearts and mind and souls together love peace and harmony, love, peace, and harmony. I love my heart and soul. I love all of humanity. Join hearts together in unity. Love, peace, and harmony, love, peace, and harmony. Allow our hands to slowly withdraw and place them gently on your stomach. Fill their bodies with a golden stream of light. And if there's any particular hurt or blockage you sense, leave one hand on your lower abdomen and put the other one maybe on your heart center or on your stomach or on your head, whatever may hurt. And let's repeat the mantra. I love my heart and soul. I love all of humanity. Join hearts and souls together. May love, peace and harmony. May love, peace and harmony bring joy and laughter and healing. And stay within that peace and calm.
May peace be with you all. Before you open your eyes, visualize that you have washed your hands in a crystal bowl of water up to your elbows and stand under a stream of crystal rainbow glinted water and cleanse your entire body and feel fresh and restored. And in your own time, you can open your eyes and come back to the stream. Burpee, I haven't heard how our little Jesse is. We need to send a message, I think, to Francine. Thank you, Ruby. Let me know, okay? Well, that was um, really pleasant. I hope you enjoyed that. And Denise, keep me posted. <laughs> You're most welcome, everybody. I'm glad you enjoy it. I must say, I um, love this book. I love Bright Side of the Moon. But there's something, this fits in my purse. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. And um, there's something like, something soft and radiant in these short stories. Hopefully it makes people realize that there's something beyond our walls that destroy and inspire you to make sure you keep creating a beautiful structure that you are. Yeah. It's, uh, it's really special. I, it's quite something that I'm having, you know, a collection of these pink books. The first one, Memoirs, is it's like a collector's item. The stories go deeper into everything. Yeah. And um, in regards to Tony's book, we're still working on some stories he keeps revealing every day. <laughs> and um, Marianne, I bless, little blessing coming to you. Happy to know that she's with someone I no. <laughs> She's quite a special little being. So people, I will say good night. Yeah. So it's always a process to come away from being with you guys, but I know um, how the energies work. You're always in my heart. Good night, Stefan. Thank you. No problem, Verbi. It is available on Amazon. I don't know what regular shops. I know it'll be in Waterstones here. Um, but apparently my publisher sent it off to 50,000 different stores. So we'll see. Have a good week, and um, thank you for coming. Thank you for being who you are, and bless you, everybody. Thank you, Julie. I'll give send you the um, 
information of Jeremy from the Dort. Thank you, everybody.